Hey everybody, uh, welcome back to another Volition stream. Uh, I'm Josh Stinson, the video editor slash streams are here. Uh, I keep forgetting to put streams are back <laughs> in my little lower third thing. Uh, but we're going to be doing uh, something similar to what we did last week. We're going to be kind of going in depth with one of our developers here. Uh, and today, the developer we have is... <laughs> <laughs> my name is Brian Trafficanti. I am the uh, creative director. And uh, over in the control room, as always, we've got... Hey, hey Mike, Mike Watson here, uh, Senior Community Developer for Volition, uh, here moderating chat and running production behind the scenes. Nice to see everybody, and I'm going to turn you back over to Josh. Thanks, Mike. But, yeah, we're, uh, we're going to be taking another look at one of our developers here. And uh, you, you said, did you tell me that you had been on a stream in the past? Was it an AOM thing? Yeah, yeah, last okay. year, I think a bunch of us got in a room and we were just jamming on some of the, the latest content and playing the game a little bit and having huh. some fun, yeah. All right. I was on. in the back, a little quiet. Oh, okay, you know, like, right, right, right. Kind of mousy, uh, get over, Jason. <laughs> but yeah, you're a uh, you're the, uh, a creative director here right now, and I think that's um, this is something that I see people ask a lot, especially if they're people who are just starting to get interested into like how games are made and stuff. And that's just like, what is a director and what is a creative director? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, well. Different studios are going to have different definitions of, of their roles. Yeah. Uh, but traditionally, in, in the role of a director, uh, it's a high-level role, and these are the folks that sort of set guides um, and a lot of the vision and quality for, for whatever the, the target is in the area that they're directing. Right. Um, and like I said, at different studios I've been at, I've been at EA Studios, I've been at Ubisoft, I've been here at Volition for a decade. Yeah. Um, there's there's just a different per, uh, metric for, for what what that would mean for those directors. Okay. Here at Volition, uh, uh, the, one of the reasons why I came back, I, I did five years, mm -hmm. uh, worked on a whole bunch of great games, uh, left for a few years and then came back, and I've been back five years already, which is pretty crazy. Yeah. But what I really like about the definition of that at Volition is pure collaboration. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't uh, operate in a way where it's dictatorial or, or you know, the, the, the one to rule it all. Like, <laughs> we know that everything that we do is plussed and better because we share and operate together. Right. We do lots of feedback, lots of critiques, and we always partner with team members, all the team members all over the place to kind of generate. So as a director, uh, it's a big part of your role is to not only clarify what it is that the direction that you want things to go in, okay. but to also make sure that that direction is resonating with the folks that are following it, because we're not really into marching orders. That's that's not what we do here. Right. I mean, like you, you know, you said that like other people can like share ideas across disciplines and stuff, and I've like even just being you know back for just a, a few months it's like oh yeah that's how that's this stuff yeah. works here because it's like i've been able to suggest a couple little things i've seen other people suggest it like you know somebody who's not an artist or you know doesn't you know do writing or something they still ha can come to people with those ideas yeah. and i think that's super cool and that also reminds me i had something i wanted to run by you after yeah. the stream excellent <laughs> yeah uh, uh, the volition uh, Literally, I've, I've never, of all the places I've been, things I've worked on, yeah. Volition is the only place in my experience that everybody can impact a project. Everybody yeah. has a great idea that can go to anybody with that idea. And ultimately, any Volition game you've played, you are playing ideas from, from a variety of, of sources that came yeah. up with these great ideas. That, that is a fact. <laughs> um, even to the, to the, you know, we always want to have you know, an operative structure, and we always want to uh, get our ducks in a row and, and make sure that we're using yeah. our time wisely and progressing. Uh, but we actually do leave things a little loose-ended uh, during production because that's what we expect. Uh, awesome Weeks are an, an amazing example of that. Have you guys ever talked about that? Uh, yeah, we uh, back uh, during, like, the uh, like 10th anniversary streams we did for uh, Saints Row, we did, like, you know, each game... And I believe we did show some like old like awesome week stuff that didn't make it into Saints Row Four. I believe yeah. we showed the dragon. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, so uh, yeah, I mean, all those games have have had uh, content and um, you know uh, ideas from from team members. It, it, it's there's nothing like it. It, it. It's what makes it so cool to yeah. be volition and and so personal, which is really cool. We all have these wonderful relationships, and everybody's open to ideas from everybody. So the right. second part of your question, the difference f between um, direction, uh, as a creative director, I focus on the creative content. Mm -hmm. um, so that is an oversight uh, for vision with art, narrative, and design. Right. So very much a referee. 
um, is making sure that those folks are all driving towards one unified, cohesive uh, okay. target. Um, but again, because of the way we work, um, very rarely are there are there like massive disagreements and, mm-hmm. and issues where where we need to uh, sort of like course correct. Everybody uh, is always synergized and. I hate that word. <laughs> They're always on page it's, and on board with one I, another. Yeah, I, I feel like that's a thing I've noticed is like this is the first um, like place I've worked at that was like an office setting. I've always, you know, either self employed or like even before that it was just like I was a dishwasher or something, you know. And it's like the instant I came here, like it's the word synergize crept in like just crept into my vocabulary and I don't know I, how. I know, I know. <laughs> I, 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 it's been ruined in so many forms of media, but but it, but I mean it. Like it, yeah. it, it is really true. You can go uh, into the kitchens and you can go into you know the hangout areas and, and people are, are riffing and collaborating and it's it's it's, it's so cool. Yeah, and I, I've wondered like you know because you said you worked at a couple other studios before. Um, you know, Volition is like a a like medium sized studio, right? Would you say it's like medium sized, like with the amount of like people at least? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, that's fair to say for sure. Uh, have you worked at any other studios that were like medium sized or anything like that? Or have you been like small, big? Yeah, uh, really across the board. I've worked okay. at the largest studio in the world, and I yeah. and I've started way, 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 way back when twenty years when when it was uh, teams of ten and twelve and fifteen. Okay, uh, which we're seeing a big. Uh, Reinsurgence of, of indie games and indie studios like that. That right. culture of everybody owns everything and just get it done and yeah. lots of um, lots of people, lots of skills, or pitching in in any way they can. Um, right. So, uh, yeah, I think um, here, I think mid size is, is fair to say for us, um, and and I think um, that is our advantage of why we can work the way that we do. I, yeah. I, I do understand if you grow exponentially, you become large. I was at Ubisoft in Montreal, and it was three thousand. 3,000 people in that Shit. building. And so... Just in it, the building? Um, well, they had, they had multiple buildings. Oh, okay, they had literally, uh, okay. In the one that I was in, I, was, I think it was close to two, like 1,800 or 2,000 people in, okay. in the, the Peck building where they do a lot of their big assassins and Far Cries and things right. like that. And, um, and I wasn't shocked to see that they had a more rigid structure and, and form and process in doing things. That's a lot of people doing a lot of things. That, that made sense to me. Yeah. Um, but... Um, you you definitely you have an advantage to be to be our size, uh, and in smaller you have an advantage because there's less people to kind of you know have right. to uh, navigate through. But um, you're at a disadvantage because you you just you're just so small. Your 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 limitations mm-hmm. on development are, are there. So uh, this is to me is, is the right size. This is the the space to um, really uh, exist in at least in terms of uh, what I like for development. Yeah. Um, Just enough, not too much, the right amount, right? Right. Good blend. You mentioned that, you know, you were here for Volition and you left and then came back. So which which Volition games have you worked on? Yeah. So when I came here, the studio was uh, growing. They were working on just uh, pre-production Red Faction Guerrilla, and I got hired for Saints Row 2. And Saints Row 2 at that time was just coming out of the phase pre-production, early pre-production phase. Mm. Um, so they needed to ramp up a lot of resources to kind of get get the game going, get the game into. Uh, so I started with Saints Row Two, and uh, there's there's a funny story because after we finish games here, you get this R and R break, mm-hmm. which the studio recognizes that that final push and get everything in, get it done. You got producers on you like this, and you're <laughs> like that, and everybody wants to do a great job. Yeah. Um, and I got tapped the second day of finishing the project. Like, didn't even like get my, di- you know, didn't even breathe yet, and yeah. it was like. There was a departure I had to fill on Red Faction Armageddon. Oh, geez. So they asked if I would step into that role and basically not take an R&R and just literally move into a new project now because that project had a milestone <laughs> literally that week. <laughs> so, so of course, you know, uh, I, I went into that. So I was on uh, Red Faction Armageddon. After Red Faction, I was on a project here called Insane, uh, hmm. a short-lived right. thing that which I actually uh, left to pursue uh, in, in Montreal. Uh, and then I came back, and uh, we were doing Agents of Mayhem. Okay. All right. <clears throat> and then... To yeah, the... it's... So, yeah. When you, when you first... When you started working at Saints Row 2, what posi- like what were you doing at that time? I was a time? world builder at that time. I okay. was a, a, a lot in content. I had come from an EA studio uh, called Mythic, and I was an art lead uh, okay. and fantasy MMOs, and I was right, doing a lot right. of PC development. And uh, what attracted me... To Volition was um, a friend of mine that I work with. 
We've actually been together at four studios. I count Volition twice. Really? I count Volition and Deep Silver Volition. Okay. So he actually hired me into the industry 20 years ago at a small studio called Lodestone Games. Nice. Lodestone closed. We went to Mythic Games. Yeah. He joined Mythic. He left Mythic for Volition, and he'd been pinging me for years. <laughs> He's like, you got to come here, man. you got to come here. This place is great. And... Um, then I came here, then I left and came back, and he stayed. So I, I count four times that I've worked with this, this guy. Right. He's still here, and he's a he's, uh, wonderful, wonderfully talented guy and a really good friend. Um, yeah, so so that, that first push. And the big thing for me was um, my early career was all PC dev, mm -hmm. and consoles were really becoming hot shit. And not, not that, I mean, we've all, uh, I've been playing console games since I was a kid. That's what, like... That's what yeah. I'm about. But really, it was the Xbox. That, that first gen was starting to really ramp up. And, and yeah. uh, I saw, as a developer, I saw that, and I really wanted to get involved in that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's funny because, right, back in the day, you'd go to the game store, and it was all PC shelves. Yeah. And those shelves got smaller and smaller and smaller. Yeah, once and, consoles kind of and, caught up with, like, the horsepower a little bit. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and also, and that's what really attracted me into uh, Saints Row 2, so MMOs, by design, are these these very large games, and they're there to sustain years and years of content and gameplay. Right. And uh, these open world games started popping up, and um, I was blown away. Um, I, I remember coming here and I got my interview, um, and I could not believe what I was seeing on my interview. They were, you know, because <laughs> they're just showing you around different parts of the game, and this is the people you work with, and here's what'll be going on. And we're also doing this. We're also doing that, and. Um, it actually was more content in Saints Row 2 than the MMO I was working on. Really? I, I, I could not believe it. And, wow. And that game that I was working on, it was a game called Warhammer Online, okay. was um, kind of the old school, like build a zone and populate it with things to fight and put some interesting landmarks and some dungeons and things like that. Yeah. Uh, but what I saw happening in, in uh, Stillwater was, was mind-boggling. It was like, it was, it was amazing and diverse and big and full of life and, and like... Just more more things than, than I thought. And it's funny because um, a bunch of the guys uh, at the studio when I was leaving, like, oh, oh you're so lucky. You're going to go to, like, console dev. I hear console dev's easier. <laughs> no, I'm going to a game that's actually bigger and cooler and, and uh, a lot more parts and pieces to kind of, like, work on. But, yeah. Um, but that was that was a real surprise to me. And, and, um, and of course, in, in console development, data onto the console is, is, a, is, a, is another step, right? Yeah. PC dev, you, you at least back then when I was doing that stuff, you migrated your files over onto the PC itself and you went through a test phase of prototyping. Yeah. But, but the, the data was there on the PC. And, but here we have a crunching system where we take data and we have to run it through a bunch of crunchers that converts that data into the various consoles, PlayStation and Xbox and things like that. Yeah. Um, so it's a little bit of like like upfront work and, and the way that you handle uh, streaming and things like that. Mm -hmm. Data management was different. So that was something uh, big and new and exciting because that, that's what's always really gotten me into wherever I've gone. It's been because there's something really cool and exciting to grow on. It's something that I'm yeah. really dumb at. <laughs> like that's what I'm attracted to like doing things I don't think I should or could do, but <laughs> but then seeing and making sure I can do it. And, <laughs> but but that's how we you know we push ourselves and grow like that. Right. Um, and so uh, yeah, it was that was it was a blast, and I wanted to. I left the interview feeling like I nailed it, you know. <laughs> but but I left wanting it really bad. I really thought that it was going to be something. And when I got the opportunity to join, I, I um, you know I, I grew up on the East Coast, which is where a lot of my jobs have been, and, and family and everything. I left all of that for here because yeah, uh, it was a no brainer. Okay, so with. Uh you said you were a, a world builder yeah, on yeah, SR2. Yeah, yeah. So is that, are you working on any art assets yourself, or, are you, is, or is world building just like building the city out with assets made by other people? So uh, at that time, we did everything. Everything. We, we had, right. we had uh, external partners, and we sent things out like that, and sometimes they would come back and we would clean them up. And it was interesting, when I came back, um, I, I came back as a, as a senior developer. I had a bunch of years in the industry. Yeah. And so they, they really threw me in the deep end. They're, <laughs> they're like, uh, well, our documentation, it's over there, and read that, and, and that's over there, but, but, but you've been doing this a while, so go. Yeah. And so one of the things I got very quickly were a lot of interiors and mission interiors because they require a little bit more of a tech um, workflow to set up. Okay. Um, and in some ways they're actually easier because they're sort of compartmentalized. Yeah. Um, and so the first interior I got thrown at was the courthouse. 
uh, where, mm. where in, the, in the first mission there when, when Gat's on trial. And, and so I get in there. And what had happened was we had the city from, from Saints Row 1. Uh-huh. Uh, it was migrated over, and the big changes were made. When I, when I joined the team, it was a lot of green. It was just green box. Some, some places gray box. At that time, yeah. we were doing green box. And so when you got data uh, as, an, as an artist, as a world-building artist, um, you would open up your file uh, and you just saw green cubes everywhere. Right? <laughs> yeah. um, so there's a little bit of dot connecting. You have to uh, look at the layout and read what the mission design is and what, mm-hmm. what's supposed to happen where. Um, there's a lot of technical uh, information you need to absorb, like how much memory do you have and then how yeah. it's being streamed in and things like that. Uh, understanding what's important, like what, what is happening in the mission moments and in the narrative, and then really uh, highlight those uh, those opportunities and, and when those instances happen. Right. So I went into the um, interior business quite a bit, and that one was uh, a lot of fun. And, and there was a uh, man, I broke so much shit. It was it was so <laughs> it was so. Um, I hadn't really dealt with dynamic object counts before because mm. you, there, there's only so many you can have before you're, you're blowing CPU, GPU. Right. You know, one is for one and one is for the other. But. Yeah. And, dy- and dynamic objects just being, is that just like physics objects? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So every uh-huh. time you, you there, there's a cost to have a dynamic object and once it's uh, interacted with, then, then that cost goes up because right. now physics is saying, am I here, am I here, am I here? Mm-hmm. And so I, had to <laughs> I built this little, like, um, and if you, if you, when you play it, when you come out, there's a little cafeteria, right? Uh-huh. And that was really cool. Um, the game I came from, Warhammer, Games Workshop, you could not make an art asset without an approved concept from Games Workshop. Okay. So we had a 24-hour turnaround. We, are, we have nine amazing concept painters at our studio. They would paint... Um, assets, whether it was a train, a mortar, a city, a castle, whatever it was, right. that overnight it would go back to London. They would approve it, and in the morning you could then build your asset mm. because they worked on it. And Volition was way more like, you got this. We, you know, we'll, we'll iterate. We'll do feedback. We trust you. Like, go for it. Right. So when I got the uh, courthouse, I mean, literally, it was like six green boxes. <laughs> it was <laughs> like, oh wow. Like so. So as an artist. There's an aesthetic story I wanted to tell. I wanted you to go in there, and, and I did these little like curved desks. I remember, and I had the seal of uh, still water, and I used two L's in still water. You used two L's in still water. Yeah, I got, I got, <laughs> I got talking to, I got learned. Um, but I, but I put the desks there, and then I grabbed the mission designer, and I said, uh, you know, just make sure I know, like, when we leave for the combat, yeah. what happens. And uh, my big idea in there was like, let's put glass panels all across the balcony so that we're having the shootout with the guards on the ground, all this glass will start shattering. Right. And so back in the dynamic objects, it was like, uh, too many, you gotta, you gotta oh, weave it down, weave it down. But I did this cafeteria space when you exit. There's a little food area. I thought it'd be cool to put a food area. And each plate was dynamic, and I stacked <laughs> hundreds, <laughs> hundreds of plates in this, in this cafeteria. <laughs> and so I checked my work in, you know, I get thumbs up. And then um, Maitri, the tech director at the time, still here, great guy, he's like, uh, can, I, can I talk with you for a second? <laughs> and he sends me a screenshot of the frame rate at, like, you know, zero. Because when you shot every plate, <laughs> it blew up oh, and filled God. the screen with dynamics. Um, so when you go in there now, you'll see, like, four plates. <laughs> it's like, oh, man. Okay, okay. That's um, great. But that's something that, that SR2... Um, in, in my opinion, for, for the, the, the budgets we had, uh, everything was dynamic. Mm-hmm. We, we, we had times where we had to go back through um, and do mem reports and, and uh, performance reports where it was like, dang it, like I, I had 20 unique things in this block, in this area, but now I can only afford 10, right? So let me right. take the 10 out. But we always chose to keep it dynamic versus static because we knew that um, that's what really made it fun to go around and smash things, and, and we also had the wheel right. the environment things, and they, they right, had a yeah. big cost too. But we we, we didn't want to lose that stuff, um, so we made other choices and, and compromises to, to to keep that in there. All right, uh, we have a question from the chat from Mr. Saints Godzilla asking, "Did you work in any crib interiors?" I did. I you did. did. Um, crib. In- so again, like like uh, with uh, that. They were another kind of technical challenge because you had these triggers in these areas. If it was the bedroom or it was the living room, mm-hmm. you had to make sure that each area that would that would roll in, each each group of objects fit and fit within memory, and you had to set up cribs very particularly, and everything had to fit just right. I did the downtown crib. I did the... 
not the marina, but but I did three or four. I did the, one of the first ones you get when you go down that little steps and you're in that little little uh, row house building. I did that right. one. I did downtown. I did. There's a big. Um, there's a big apartment building, and the and the crib was upstairs. I did that one, um, and a couple other ones. I, I, I can't remember all of them, uh, but they were really uh, they were really rewarding, because you yeah. you kind of started with this little shell of a thing with a little cinder block TV in the corner, <laughs> and as an artist, you're like, I want detail, I want information, I want really cool stuff. Um, but then you can go in game and test, and you can trigger all these things locally and watch all the upgrades happen. And yeah. it was really cool to see, like, oh, this is so cool. Like, players are going to be able to get all these options. I love that. Right. I did a lot of store interiors as well. Okay. Um, a lot of the clothing stores I did. Um, sloppy Seconds, and the names still make me <laughs> still make me <laughs> laugh to say, like. Uh, but I, uh, but again, like I, my my first workload was a lot of technical things. Like I did the yeah. hospital for the Johnny Gat mission, where we get Johnny out of the hospital. Okay. That actually went through outsourcing, and it came back. And the tech for them was giving them a lot of problems, mm. um, like setting everything up. So they asked if I could take a look at it. So of course, if it's like if I'm going to look at it, I'm going to put my stank on everything. <laughs> I, I, I was like, I got to have this, and I got to have exit yeah. signs. I got to have all this cool stuff. And that was a lot of fun. And that had that cool mode where all the lights turned off. So I had to make a separate version of all of that okay. art and all that content. So it was like the, the one, and then when the lights come out, and you go you go outside. And okay. That was a lot of fun. And I did the police station. Uh, I got a lot of the interiors. Uh, that was that was cool. I didn't get the prison island because uh, they took that. That was gone. Uh -huh. But, yeah, that, because that was the intro of the game, that got a lot of focus and time. And so right. like, by the time I joined, they, they had settled down in there. Okay. Uh, when, like, when you were building that stuff out, because, like, there's some things I have a hard time visualizing, like, how it is done, and a lot of times it's just, like, how do you, how do you start? Like, especially when yeah. you say, like, you're given something and it's, like, you know, five gray or green cubes, and that's what you have to start off from. Are you, do you have, like, concept art that you're also referencing from for this stuff, or is a lot of it just, like, up to your discretion from, like, yeah. from the get-go? Yeah, Saints Row 2... Uh, there wasn't a lot of concept. It was a lot of us okay. grabbing photographs and references and our own doodles, and I, and I love that. Yeah. I'd been doing that in my career for a long time. It wasn't until I got to some other projects that had more of a, a true concept pipeline. So I didn't mind it at all. I, I genuinely, I loved it. Um, and so we would grab some photographs and just grab other artists and lead artists and art directors and yeah. just say, like, I'm thinking of doing this. In fact, um, in downtown... If there's 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 the water coming up in this little corporate park. Yeah. And it's funny because I call it Chunk 125. Because <laughs> Chunk 125, <laughs> I don't want to get too far off the, the question. Uh -huh. um, but there's actually a pattern on the ground. The pattern on the ground is um, a logo from a company I worked on, uh, interpreted. Okay. Um, because um, I because I got to do what I wanted. What I wanted to do in there, we had to pull a skyscraper out. We had too much memory. This this one building uh -huh. was too big. So we pulled the building out, and I had this cool spot, and, and and I'd come from this pipeline of, like, follow the concept, follow the concept, we'll beat you up, follow the concept. <laughs> uh, they were much nicer than that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I said to some other guys, I'm like, well, well what should I do? And they're like, I don't know, what do you want to do? And I'm mm -hmm. like, I want to do a park. And they're like, cool, do a park. <laughs> and this is where people eat lunch, and they walk around. And so there's these little watery areas, and there's these, uh, I think, five... Uh, water spouts coming up, and if you look, it's a blue and white star, mm. and that was Lodestone's nautical one part of their logo. Oh, was the nautical geez. star. And so oh, that's how man. that stuff comes up, and and so much of that, the old tower ball across the street that yeah. you could dislodge, that was just me messing around with the geosphere huh. and trying that. So you got a lot of photo wrap, and you ran with that, and um, you put a lot of, and it was also very topical. Mm -hmm. There were jokes in the office that that were hot at the time <laughs> that that made it in the game. I sat next to, to Brian Merman, because um, right. we were the Brines. That's how I got my nickname, Traf, because somebody walked in on my first day, and they're like, hey, Brian, and the two of us were like, huh? <laughs> and they're like, okay, you're Merman, you're Traf. I'm like, great, let's do that. And uh, uh, Merman's restaurant in Saints Row 2 was because, cause, you know, okay. I'm like, Merman, let's, let's, let's do that. That's funny. Let's turn that into a, like a Chili's uh, <laughs> thing. So that was just us saying, like, I own this area. And I want to add my own personal flavor to it. And, yeah. and what, what I feel right here and now is, is, is doing this. Yeah. And that was really fun. And that was what contributed so much to uh, the diversity in there. Yeah. Because it, it w not just was it planned to have all these amazing parts and pieces, but when we got in there, we just plussed it. We just constantly pushed and plussed and plussed. Yeah. 
Uh, we have another question uh, from Jay Laughing in the chat asking, uh, did you do the maze-like cave system? <laughs> Love that area, but it's easy to get lost without paying attention. Yes, uh, no, Tim Lawson did the caves. And uh, I agree. It, it's re <laughs> it really is. Um, Tim is one of my favorite artists I've ever worked with in my life. Tim did the downtown, uh, the underground mall. Mm. He did um, the the caves. And I was actually happy not to have done the caves. <laughs> They're a little more complex and organic and, and difficult to put in there. But, but yeah. no, unfortunately. But it was amazing to go into reviews and have all the guys bring what they're working on. So yeah. Tim would bring his caves and talk about and get some feedback about what would be cool and what he could add. And some guys are in trailer park and they're bringing their stuff over. Other mm -hmm. guys are working in the cemetery or residential. And then we're all just bringing these things to meetings and just, just riffing on what would make it cooler. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, we have another question from Mega Freeman asking, uh, what is your favorite place you designed in Stillwater? Excellent. Um, I am... Very happy. Um, oh man, I did so many. You know what it was? Uh, y y this is gonna sound nuts because yeah. it's so little. <laughs> Fight Club. Okay. Fight Club. It was. It was. Um, we were always uh, gotta go, gotta go, gotta go. Right. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot to do. Yeah. And we had a lot of fun doing it. But for some reason, when I got Fight Club, um, I was able to kind of take a little more time. Not not that that I thought. It was the most. I just had a ton of fun. I had a ton of fun with. It. I came up with a logo on the ground and the porta yeah. potties outside and just played with that and, and the blood stains and uh, it was really neat. I just thought it was really cool to be um, how it was, you know. Like like I, I liked having that. It was just fun. Yeah. It was my own little thing. I also got to do the uh, the arena, the inside where where we fight Maro and the oh and the trucks. yeah yeah. I got to do that too, and that was more organic, more like rocky stuff. And and the one thing um, you had asked earlier. Um, we we didn't have an editor. Yeah. Like today, you can get Unity, Unreal. You know, you get these amazing editors and these amazing tools. We build everything in Max. Okay. And and Max, we did it. I mean, there it is. You can play <laughs> it. But but um, Max is not meant to be that kind of an editor. It's limiting on tools. So right. so the artists were truly up to. We painted everything in Photoshop. We made our own textures, uh, and we modeled everything in Max ourselves. Huh. So when you. When you waited the seven minutes for the file to open because it was so oh, complex, um, when you got it, uh, you really put everything into it because you didn't want to have to reload. <laughs> and it was a crapshoot with uh, Autoback. Autoback sometimes would kill you for five minutes huh. because it's so complex of a file to save. And you don't want to lose that time. You're into it. You're riffing. You want to go. Yeah. And, uh, man, it was uh, it was a crapshoot of, like, do I turn off Autoback? Because if I crash, I lose all my work. But this you is 20 minutes a day. Like, yeah. What do we do? Inevitably, you you got overconfident. You turned oh, out of back off, and then you were like, "You lost no! some, you lost some work to that." And you lose stuff. You're like, no. oh man. But, uh, one thing I'm curious about, like, I know, like, I know that there are like editors that like greatly help with this particular problem. But it sounds like this might have been harder with with Max. But like, how do you, how would you handle like making sure everything was like to correct scale with the player character? Were there, like, metrics that you could set up in there? Like, or were you just, like, did you just have, like, a model and just, like, yeah. a character in there and just go, like, that looks good? Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. I mean, like, like uh, typically you make a one-by-one-by-two box, and okay. that represents your player capsule. And right. then we have, um, in every game we've worked on, we just have a bunch of, of uh, metrics that are, like, the number of width. Like, the, yeah. the longest and ongoing battle for <laughs> artists and designers... <laughs> Is the width of a door <laughs> really? Absolutely, because because it's one of those things that human beings under you know the height of a doorknob and you know the un, you know the width yeah. and height of a door, and when that is not to scale, it's too big or too wide. You pick on it instantly. Yeah. But our game is co-op, so we always have to make sure uh, doors could get two people in at the same time. Yeah. And same thing with roads. Like our roads are actually six meters wide per lane, mm. and so real roads are like three or four. But we need enough width to allow cars to cut between. So that is another right. constant art and design battle where we're like, you know, can we can we bring the roads in a little <laughs> bit? And the designers like, of course not. Yeah, that's and funny. of course now I favor you know design. Yeah, because <laughs> it's like I want to. I want to. I mean, I, I, I feel fun. like I've I've played like older games like PS One, PS Two era where like there, like the metrics were far more like uh, like realistic and like you know some games back then 
had kind of clunky controls, you had a really wide turning radius, so it's like you try to get through a door and you would always just like nick your shoulder yeah, and you yeah, could just yeah. never line yeah. up with the door correctly to, to thread the needle. Yeah. Uh, we got a comment from Shrimp Wiggle in the chat saying, uh, it can't be overstated how impressive the variety of interiors in SR2 truly is, not just uh, compared to the later games, but other games of a genre as well. There's so many freaking stores in this game. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, 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 um, and, and to, to thank you, I'm glad you noticed, because uh, reuse was very difficult. Yeah. Like, like in today's uh, tools, Unity, you've got blueprints and, and prefabs that you restamp the same thing. Mm. Because these Max files were built the way we were, other than like mm. textures that we fetched from other you know, parts of the server and applied, uh -huh. meshes, there was very little reuse. We did have a, a good prop system. We had a wonderful prop artist who basically made all those props. Um, and so we did have a tool where you could bring up this library of props and, and, and you would use those to add okay. them to your scene. But like anything like like the walls of the uh, of the stores, and I did one on high end that has these glass panels I tried to wrap around and do all this stuff. And anything yeah. like that, you you were on your own. You had to <laughs> you had to you you weren't getting much help at it. But there were a lot. There 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 was a lot. My list was quite long when it was like yeah, yeah. go through. <laughs> Uh, Feared Symmetry in the chat asking, uh, was there anything you worked on in SR2 that ended up getting cut? Hmm, I don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. I came in at the beginning of production, so everything yeah. was sort of settled. Um, I, I really don't, we made a lot of compromises. A lot of things got, yeah. got reduced in scale or size or certainly in complexity, but I don't think anything that I actually did didn't go in. I, nothing off the Man. top of my head, which, which is another like, um, <clears throat> to say that that was a unicorn. Uh, I won't go that far, but like, yeah. there was a lot of content, and we really believed that 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 it was all it was it was the right amount for us, right? So right. We, we pushed friendly fires. I did a bunch of those, man. Like, no, I, I don't think anything did, believe it or not. Believe huh. it or not. Man, like, that sounds crazy. nuts to say. Like, yeah, because like, like every game's got cut stuff. <laughs> yeah, that like, sounds like a problem. <laughs> like, why didn't we? I mean, that, I feel like it also <laughs> just kind of speaks to how SR2 just has, like, so much stuff in it. Yeah. Like, like things that, like, I'm sure there was obviously stuff in that game that got cut, but, like, a lot of stuff like made it through. Yeah, I, I, as part of the content side, like I said, a lot of it was uh, our process is the green box, gray box. We'll lay things out. We'll, yeah. we'll play in it. So by the time I got a lot of it, it had been riffed and iterated on, stretched and squashed, and things like that. Mm -hmm. And um, no, I mean, I, I handled a, a good number of mission interiors too. I did the, the crack house and, and red light, and all of that stuff made it in there. I don't, I don't remember Man, anything coming out. That's, it's, that's kind of nuts. That's really that's that is, crazy. <laughs> It is crazy. The world, uh, everything, nothing, nothing was was sliced off. Everything Man. stayed in there. Uh, yeah, I feel kind of guilty now. <laughs> <laughs> it's just. <laughs> uh, yeah. We had Teratoid Rope uh, asking in the chat, uh, which crib interior was the hardest to design? Um, I think it was the downtown one. There was a. Um, uh, so with streaming, right, we, we have to load in what, what's around the player, yeah. and we had a brick pattern. If you open up this one layer, uh, file in Max, you'd see basically what looked like a wall of bricks. Mm. And so each brick represents what is a chunk we were loading at that time. And if the player was in that chunk, then we loaded the, the bricks, or the three, four bricks around it. Okay. And so with that particular crib, I think there's a big window that lets you look outside. Correct me if I'm wrong, my memory isn't too bad. Um, so that means I couldn't unload a lot of the um, oh, outside geez. world, which means the memory was being loaded in that. Yeah. And so when I kept trying to make that go from like run down to really cool and cooler, cooler, uh, my limit. I had a lot of limitations in that one. And mm. I just remember like for whatever reason that one that there was just a whole bunch of crazy tech issues and problems. Huh. And doors were the worst. <laughs> I can't. I cannot <laughs> state how hard it was to get a door to work because the little node we had to, to show you that because the player interacts with from one direction, mm -hmm. you couldn't tell which direction your node was because uh, we, we just didn't have it working right. Yeah. So you literally would make a door four or six times and rotate ninety, rotate ninety, and then go into the game and it would hit you in the head. And <laughs> rotate game, it went the wrong way. <laughs> rotate game, it just swing out from the frame, and you're like, what? Um, oh man! I wouldn't even be surprised if we shipped with some door bugs. Like, like they were, they okay. were really hard. Uh, that 
I hearing stuff like that is like comforting for me though, because like when I uh, when I wasn't working here for a little bit, uh, I did do a little bit of freelance stuff, and I like had to learn a little bit of like Unreal Engine four stuff, which you know Unreal Engine yeah. the you know, modern engine has a lot more conveniences mm-hmm. and stuff. But like while learning that, there were some times that like you would do a thing. It's like I did this exactly the same as before. Why? Like yeah. why? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was that was. Uh, I saved all my door bugs. Yeah. To like the end of the project because I knew this was good. Right, this is the door, door day. And memory. Door and memory. I got a memory bug literally the last week of like time yeah. to fix these bugs, and it was it was the nightmare bug. It's the one that that you you will you will go nuts, mm-hmm. right? Which is um, <laughs> stand here and the world unloads, right? Oh, geez. which means we're out of memory. Yeah. And and the problem with that is the way that we set things up. It was very difficult to work on lots of layers, lots of files, and it wasn't. And it's, and, and it, typically, I owned like my the area I owned was right here, and if you stood on the corner of what I owned, the rest of the world was unloading. So it really wasn't my problem. <laughs> it was their problem, um, and that took. I mean, it took weeks. It literally took a long time to to figure out how to get the memory down so that when you stood there, the the whole game didn't go poof. Yeah, <laughs> it was brutal. Uh, the Saints Rule 247 are asking, uh, I'm just wondering who made the Cemetery Sex Dungeon. <laughs> I don't know if he wants me to say his name. <laughs> I think that was Team Mayhem. We had different names. Okay. Uh, different teams. Redux, Mayhem. Uh, darn it. There were four of us, and, I, and only two of them were popping up. But Mayhem, Redux, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Uh, and so there was this nice little, little, little... Uh, competitive energy between us, <laughs> and, and uh, I think it was the Mayhem guys. We were Redux that had uh, Trailer Park, okay. Cemetery, and Industrial. I think. Okay. Yeah. I never knew about but, that. But what I can say is that that was not planned. That wasn't. Yeah. That wasn't like a direction. I mean, direction was go have fun, right? Yeah. But that was that was somebody on their own going like, you know, I'm gonna push. I'm gonna push this. Yeah, and, and but they got people around them to let them know if they've gone too far, and then everyone's like, oh, "Yeah." <laughs> uh, Matrix Vinjian in the chat asking, uh, "Who came up with the Saint of All Saints statue?" Um, I don't know, I don't know, but hmm. I believe that was a carryover from from SR one. No, hmm. when we went to Purgatory, we saw it in two. Um, Frank Markhart mm-hmm. was the art director on that. Frank is one of the best art visionaries I've ever worked with in my life and so it, I wouldn't be surprised to say it was Frank. Some of, okay. those, some of those really important monumental uh, things, you know, those really defining things, those things that, that, that are statement pieces, not just like, yeah, I put a wall and a light switch. <laughs> things like that. Those are typically a little bit more considered and, and iterated on. I wouldn't be surprised if it was, was Frank or, or Chris Claffin who was one of the leads at the time. Really talented guys. Okay. Uh, one more question from Matrix, uh, asking, uh, have they fixed the door issue with the most recent engine? We've thrown out. <laughs> I, you know, I don't know. That's a good question. Mm. I'm not sure. Hmm. I, I, I don't know. Hmm. I don't know if we're using doors. <laughs> I don't know. Um. I don't know. I, all I can tell you is I, I, I couldn't do it. Yeah. It was, it was uh, you know, sometimes I would just laugh at, like, this is nuts. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> it's a door. It's funny. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Previously, you br- you brought up Merman, and I, I I know I have heard that there are stories regarding him. Uh, I know there's some Easter eggs in the game with a Merman, but I don't know like the entire. So, I don't know the 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 entire thing about this. Oh, Brian. <laughs> uh, so uh, I actually still chat with Brian. He he he, um, he and a former Volition are married, and and, and I think they okay. moved out and they were in Chicago, Detroit. They're doing good. Right. He's a great guy. I got to sit next to him. He was a tech artist. Mm-hmm. Each room had a, a tech artist to really help us with a lot of the technical challenges. And, and since it was a very technical game under the hood, there's a lot of, you know, Mike will tell you, right, there's a lot of stuff cooking back there. So my, uh, Brian was was the man. And so um, it <laughs> he was um, super talented and, and kind of a junior guy. So he came yeah. into a room of seniors and of course, we took him under his wing. But but there's a little bit of ribbing that goes on in there. That good, healthy fun, and yeah. um, uh, you at any time between midnight, I'd say between ten and like maybe four a.m., somebody somewhere in the building would scream, "God damn it, Merman!" 
<laughs> because Brian would check in a fix that broke something else. <laughs> and it just became this like fun joke, like just to hear somebody literally top of their lungs <laughs> scream, <laughs> God damn it, Marvin! <laughs> and Brian would get up and be like, what now? And he'd walk out. And, um, he, was, he was a cool dude. And um, the, the, the best story, the best yeah. story by far, is that Brian made the, the, the mistake of a little too much trust. Oh. And what he had done is he, he he turns to the room and it's all it's all veteran guys right and we're we're the kind of right. get it done group and and um, boy we had some fun and I, I I can tell you Susie Q's or the name of the boat when you get off is called the Susie Q there's a reason for that but Brian turns to the group and says guys I'm bringing my parents up I want to show them where I work okay and um, leaves and the second he leaves we're like we. we I can't believe he just did this. Like we, we could do whatever we want. When he when he walks back into this room, yeah, we we let's do this. Yeah, and um, we ended up scattering uh, maybe a thousand inappropriate pieces of material, and and <laughs> and, and, and let me just say that, and we uh -huh. put them all over his desk. So he looked like he was really into. Um, and he backs into the room, and he's like, Mom, Dad, these are the guys. And he turns and goes, Ooh, and he just sees this stuff. I mean, we wrote on the whiteboards. We, we, you know, welcome Mama Merms. We wrote all this stuff, and it was, oh, it man. was, in that moment, we, we were, of course, we're, we had tears running down our eyes knowing we got them. But I also thought, I think we're fired. Like, we, we, might, we might be in a lot of trouble. Yeah. He was great. They were great. Um, <laughs> It was it was one of the moments I, I will not forget, and um, he it, and actually it was after that where I told him, you know, you you're such a cool sport and you're a cool dude. I'm gonna can I make a restaurant? Can I make Merman's restaurant? Can yeah. I put the M on it? And 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 because uh, you have to sign when when you use a likeness or your name in a game, you actually have right, to sign okay. away uh, the rights to use the likeness. Mm. Um, and so Brian, I'm, I'm like, would you do that? And he, he signed it, and we were able to put it in there. That's and, great. And, and, um, and my mouth is dry, but somebody would always go. Man. <laughs> like like from He Man, the old cartoon. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that was the other thing they would yell. And that's how the real Merman got started. Okay. It was like, oh, Merman. That's funny. Oh uh, yeah, it was it was a crazy group. We had a guy in a room that used to steal all the plastic shrubbery in the entire building, and put them in our doorway. <laughs> so you'd come to work in the morning and walk through thirty feet of plastic trees and shrubs. Oh, and, he got, and, and the office manager told him to stop. She's like, you know, ha, 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 okay, don't do it again. And he did it again. Oh, and then she got angry and he did it again. <laughs> but that room, I mean, that, that room got, got nuts. Yeah. But, but honestly, the content that came out of that room, what we owned in there we, was, was inarguably some of the, the coolest, in my opinion, some of the coolest stuff. Because we were pushing each other and having so much fun to, to uh, really rise to the occasion and then challenge each other. It was, it was pretty... It was pretty epic. Yeah, it was. It was something. It, it's definitely remained is one of the one of the. It, it was a hard project. It was a lot of hard work, but mm -hmm. it was it was worth it. And and that's the thing. We knew it. We knew yeah. it was worth it. One of the first team meetings I came to at the studio. You know, you're a new guy and you don't know anybody. Um, so I kind of stood in the doorway, and I'm not shy, but but you know I know my place. I'm not gonna walk up and yeah. You know, like, so I'm just standing back there, and um, the room was filled, and everybody was sitting on their feet, and people were standing up, and they started playing some radio commercials, and they were just funny commercials. And my last studio was was a lot of fun, a lot of great people, but it was a different culture. Volition's culture yeah. was a lot more of, like, fun, like loud fun, loud, mm -hmm. rowdy fun. And um, I was blown away in that team meeting of listening to everybody laugh and have so much fun listening to these commercials. And I'm like, this is a really, this is different. This is a really cool thing. And uh, even that early on in the project, we 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 really liked what we were doing, and that yeah. that is really. I've been on lots of projects. I've been on ones that have you know been very successful and been, had lots of challenges. Uh, there's nothing better than than early on having that taste of like this. This is just fun. This is really cool. Yeah, it's. I feel like <clears throat> like even before I start working in the industry in some way, like I you know, I feel like there's some games that you play them like it feels like you can. Like the the enthusiasm that people have yeah. for making the game like shines through, and I feel like like with, yeah. with the amount people talk about, you know, the, the reverence they have for SR two, I feel like that's one of those games. That was one of those projects where you didn't have to have like the project asking you to do X, Y, and Z. Like you you yeah. were over delivering because you 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 
you didn't need to. You wanted to. Every mm -hmm. time you got an opportunity to do something, you just wanted to do something else. You wanted to put your unique flavors. A lot of developers, including myself, which I did in, in SR2, mm -hmm. believe it or not, I did an RFA and um, some other, uh, all my other games, is I always put my, my kids' uh, tags up huh. as, as graffiti. I put them around. And in RFA, uh, when, you, when you crash and you come out and you're running through the wet, watery, natural cave, you round a corner to go up over this bridge, and that whole water container has all my kids' huh. graffiti shots in there. That's cool. And that's one of those things where you just, you know, you do it yourself and you slap it in there. And yeah. And then, you know, it's always cool to, like, take a screenshot and show my family, like, oh, check it out, man, you're in there. That's great. It's like, oh, I don't like it, dude. Like, <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Try uh, it. Try it, kid. We have Kitty Cat 72 in the chat asking, uh, who is responsible for the Shondi stuff? Possibly. Um, <laughs> that was post, I believe it was post-release, or somewhere towards the end. It was very side. It wasn't, uh, from what I know, yeah. uh, I don't believe that was... Uh, uh, a concept from within. I think that mm. was a THQ thing that they wanted to do via bar marketing or something like that. I think right. they had a bunch of gamer characters or something like that, and they approached. Oh and yeah, I remember I think this. It was now. Something like that. I remember this now. Yeah, because like I was trying to rack my brain. Like, wait, what is? It? But yeah, I, yeah, I totally remember it this was, now. It was it was Saints Row and a couple other games. I think a couple other used yeah. characters and, and and something like that. And, yeah, and I remember uh, Chris Clapton in our room was actually tapped with with doing the art, and he was in the room doing it. Yeah. But it had nothing to do with, like, on the project side. I think it was all huh. kind of, like, brand marketing strategy kind of stuff. All right. But. Um, I mean, it's, man, it's already 447 somehow, so uh, <laughs> yeah. we should probably get to this other thing you wanted to show, which is, like, uh, you have a bunch of, like, your older work to, to show off kind of, like, leading up to uh, how, you know, you started working in the games industry. So yeah. we should uh, probably cool. switch on over to that and uh, take a look sure. at some of this stuff. Absolutely. So, um... It, it's funny, like like back then, uh, you you games uh, I, there was games I played ColecoVision, I played Atari, I played uh, Atari Lynx. I love the Lynx. Oh, that was such a cool system. Yeah. Um, NES, right? I was in I was in uh, ninth grade, middle school. And my friend from California moved, and he had an NES, and it was mm -hmm. like poof. <laughs> NES NES carts became currency in my in my school. But, like we were actually buying and selling and trading things with like with yeah. carts. Um, but um, I didn't. I didn't. I was an illustrator by design. Like in, in high school, like um, I, I drew. And like uh, here, I can. It's funny. Um, this is uh, actually a skateboard design. Rob Roscop. I was about to say this. Vision. It looks exactly yep. like it would be on and a skateboard. And I had a project in junior high to do a stipple, and I, and I was like, nice. I was into skating at the time, and so so I was messing with that kind of stuff, and and I was really traditional drawing. Uh, I got into comic books like right after high school. I actually did this is a, a page I did okay. for um, an independent comic. I don't even know if the oh, thing cool. ever shipped, and the guy never paid me, which is why there are only three pages I did. <laughs> okay, because I'm yeah. like, look, I want to get in. I want to. I want to draw. Like this is my dream. Yeah. I want to pay your artist, but, please. But you got to pay me. <laughs> and so I did a lot of these kinds of things. Um, uh, you know, a lot of comic books because I also sold comics as a dealer for a while. After oh, okay. High school. But during that. Um, you know, a lot of still life type stuff. This is what I really was was into. I was really into drawing, and so yeah. so I, I did these kinds of. Uh, it was my place. It was my safe spot. I would I would go home and headphones on and, and play my cassettes. Yeah, you know, listen to the tunes and, and just just draw. Just have a lot of fun. And I really like still lifes. I like just throwing things down in front of me. And it's funny up here. Uh, I don't know if I can zoom in. That was yeah. my 3DO. I don't know if I can. Yeah, see, right there. Yeah, that was my 3D. Yeah. Oh my God, you might be yeah. able to click and drag and look it up too. Look at that phone. Look at that phone. Oh man, I mean, yeah. And, then, and there I am with my mullet, drawing. Whoa, There's I didn't me. notice that. The mullet is hanging out the back. <laughs> and so this is about. Uh, so I graduated in high school in '90, but but I kept drawing for a few years after. I didn't. <clears throat> I didn't do the college thing. Uh, okay. I wanted to do art, and I came from a very. I, very blue collar family. No one in my family had been to college. It wasn't really a path. Yeah. Um, just got a job. That was the expectation. Go get a job. And I was kind of in that field for a while. And I wasn't miserable. Uh, this is really interesting because the Carolina Panthers, I think, just came out. Huh. And I was a Panthers fan. I figured I'd get into football <laughs> in the first year. These were Horizon models, vinyl uh, Mars Attacks kits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. And yep. so there's a, the only five bucks I had, and I just read the Lost World, Jurassic Park. And nice. I was a landscaper. 
which was my job for a really long time. So okay. I wore these boots, and there's my, my cassette player. Nice. So, so all, long story short, that was really um, what I had done. And um, after X years, um, my friend every year would go like, hey, check out this county college. They have classes. They have classes. They have classes. And after about five or six years, I was like, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give that a shot. And I went and I took a digital uh, art class. Okay. And, um, uh, and, and I went to this class, and, and it was, you know, um, they had Max, and it was freehand, which was vector drawing. Oh, yeah. Vector pads. And so I, I took this class, and in the window of the class next to where I was, it was dark, and I was like, oh, cool, what's in there? And I peek in, and I see this 3D thing happening <laughs> in this room, and I was like, what is that? And they're like, it's, it's this program that just came out. It's called 3D Studio Max. Yeah. I was like, 3D Studio Max, like, <laughs> I've got to know this. And so the, the, next, uh, the next semester, I signed up for this Max class, and it was Max 2. They were on Max DOS. Two. What I was looking at was Max 1 DOS. Oh, man. This was Max 2. Um, so I signed up for this class, and uh, I never looked back. Yeah. Like, like I, I actually, it's funny, I ran into a friend of mine, and I stopped drawing. And so what that class did, this was like a little, little Christmas scene, <laughs> it just taught, taught me how to open that piece of software up yeah. and, and model. Just so here, here's what buttons do. And the teacher was a physicist from Princeton because this Whoa. school was actually next to Princeton University. Like, yeah. believe me, they were on that side. I was, I was over there. <laughs> um, and she liked it because it had math. So it had nothing huh. to do with, like, creative and art. But, Weird. But I took this class, and um, I, I, I'm a fantasy freak so like uh, anytime it was like you know learn nerves which is this spline patch modeling i was like well i'm gonna do a dragon or, or learn learn spheres oh, i'm like man. i'm gonna do gigantor nice the robot right these are these are ancient please please cut me some slack they're 20 year old pieces but yeah um but i couldn't be stopped man i, I was so happy here's a little video oh, man this really tiny video yeah it's like what uh, 320 by 240 yeah, maybe. Yeah, right. And at the time, <laughs> and this was like how to do basic animation and, and what you can like squashes and bounces. Like yeah, I think if you you I back out of this, you can probably play this video separately to get it like full screen too. So that's like a, a postage stamp. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So oh, it was like man. how to set up keyframes, and so this class was just sort of the generic learn how to use the software, some yeah. basic functions, and that. And um, ultimately, I decided to. Um, so I left that class, and uh, the very last day of class, mm -hmm. the teacher's like thanking everybody for being there. And I, I'd been spent five years. I was actually grave digging. That was my job at the huh. time. I was working in a uh, cemetery grave Man. digging. And um, she goes through this, this book real fast, and the last page is like unwrapping. Yeah. And I'm like, wait, 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 wait. It was a jet. And I'm like, I, I, what was that? What was that? And I, <laughs> I run up and literally rip this book out of her hands, and I run back to my desk, and I look at it. And, and that's what really triggered what got me into games. I went home and um, got whatever ancient PC I could get. Mm -hmm. uh, got a copy of Max. Got a copy of Photoshop from, from some friends. Um, and, I, and I just made anything I could think of. A yeah. Anything I, I made Optimus Prime because I had the toy sitting next to me. I made, I made games I was playing at the time on the PS1. Mm -hmm. I made a Lara Croft. I made a, a snake. From, from I made anything I could make. And um, uh, that got me a job at a, at a small software company oh, nice. as, as a 3D artist. And so I started doing assets for them. Um, and then one day, the, um, and, I, and, and I started doing some, some cooler, like, uh, what I would say is more big boy things. I actually worked in San yeah. Francisco for Levi for a little while. And, I was, oh, okay. and that was a 3D model that I, that I did, like, 2D on. And, and again, please, these are, these are they're old and... Um, but I did some of this stuff, and I, and I got to do their logo, you know, again. And, and I, was, I was content and happy with, with doing these little projects for them, and this, mm -hmm. this happened on their, their demo reel. And I, then it happened, and this was the moment I will never forget because yeah. this changed everything for me. I've been a gamer. I love games. I, to this day, I start my day with games. I end my day with games. I play games with my kids. I, 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 that's all I want to do. Yeah. And the owner of this little company, it was like eight of us, pulls me in and says, check this out. Mm -hmm. And he's standing. He's, he's on his monitor. Is uh, yes, <laughs> on his monitor is a room with textures and a light bulb, and he's moving his camera around like in first person mode. And I went, "What the fuck? Whoa, 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 whoa! What is that?" And he's like, yeah. "It's this tool called Radiant," and I'm like, "What is that?" <laughs> and we were playing Soldier Fortune 
uh, every night in the studio. We'd have multiplayer maps and shoot each other. Yeah. And that was it. He he actually printed out um, the the radiant for me. Actually, let me let me show. He printed out radiant and um, the manual. Um, excuse me. He printed out the manual, and that was it. I was yeah. like done. I started making maps and modding, and I joined mod communities, and I made all these amazing versions. ICQ. Remember, you get the little, little yeah. ICQ would pop I remember up. that. I joined that, and, and I could not be stopped. Every second of every day, if, mm -hmm. if I wasn't somewhere I had to be, DMV, work, whatever, I was at home modding, making stuff, and reaching out to people. And so Soldier of Fortune was the game we were playing, and, and I made this map, this snow fort. And what I didn't realize at the time is I was actually learning a lot of core environment skills, mm. as well as level design. Because I'm just, I was in there kind of with an aesthetic approach, but of course when you're map making, you're really talking about what is the, the design right. of, of and setting up the combat and the conflict. And so I made, um, uh, I made this map, and the big thing about this for me is I got it to snow. Like nice. I, these, now these are giant cards of scrolling textures, but I oh, didn't care, that's man. What I, I was thought. I was so excited that, that I had a snow map with snow, but I learned things like skyboxes and stuff like yeah. that. And so Radiant was this opening, and then I made this other map steel, which was this big smelting factory. And Radiant uh, basically allowed you to create all these basic meshes, and it had like world space texturing. Okay. And so you would just slap these textures on. But then that started me in texture making, because mm. I wanted stripes on a wall, I wanted lights, I wanted these things. And it was also about how to light a map, and how to like make sure players can see things. And where do the ammo pickups come in? And all of this was like... Yeah. And all this time, my girlfriend, now wife, was telling me to stop wasting my time and get <laughs> like a better job. I'm like, no, you don't understand. This is it. This is what I want to do. <laughs> and so this is all that I did. And, and um, man, I, I, I loved every second of it, literally. This was Soldier of Fortune. And uh, going in at night and watching people in your map, of course, that's 1v1. One, one one. Right. That's just me. But, but logging in and playing your map with people in your map was, was like, yeah. uh, like, this is the greatest thing ever. Why would you do anything else? And then uh, I saw a comment. Uh, yes, um, when I was out in San Francisco, um, there was a Sony store, and they had eight. I, I wasn't really a driving game fan, but they had eight stations yeah. to play on, and Midtown Madness was there. <laughs> Welcome to Midtown Madness, Chicago edition. <laughs> they did the Chicago voice, and so when I came um, back, uh, I started making cars for Midtown Madness, and this okay. was my next like venture of like. How do you do this? And I actually emailed, uh, I think at the time they were called Angel Studios, which became Ensemble. Oh, okay. I emailed a dev from home, and I'm, and I'm like, I love your game. I'm having so much fun, but I really want to make my own vehicles. How, how can we do that? Yeah. Uh, and this was cool. They had this mode where it was like crush the bus, one person in a bus, and seven people in cars driving around. And, and yeah, and so I just kept doing these, um, these little... Uh, vehicles and, and uh, the first time I got my car and I had my axis wrong so my wheels were going the wrong oh, axis geez. flopping down the street uh, but yeah it was really fun really cool and I really felt like I was belonging to like a group and, and, and found like uh, more than I found more um, excitement and reward in this than, than even some of my work work yeah so I was really racing to get home and play with these things um, this is a bull shot <laughs> that didn't make it in the game. That I modeled and photoshopped in, I, I have to confess. Okay. It was ready to go, but, but I failed. Uh, this did make it in the game. I was super proud that I got my mystery machine in. That got in and the I game? changed the horn to be a, a rut row. <laughs> so I changed the wave file for the horn that when you hit it, it was rut row. That's funny. Because, uh, uh, yeah, and this is... And this is when, like, I realized, like, my own creativity can, can start to impact all of that. Yeah. Um, so that's what led to my, my confidence in my first game job, because uh, once I had all of these assets and I was already working at this little software place, I applied to three studios. I applied to, um, I think they were called 2015, 2012, the guys mm. that did the Medal of Honor uh, yeah. in Oklahoma yeah, yeah. at the time. I applied to uh, Lodestone Games, which, which I ultimately to, and I applied to Volition. Really? Volition didn't give me a, a, a call back. Oh, man. I should go talk to Mike and Jim after this. <laughs> but I did. Uh, Red Faction just came out. <laughs> Loved that game. Played it. And I wrote this long essay about why they need me. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> and, uh, but, but that was a lot of fun. And, and uh, Lodestone um, turned into... Uh, I also got into Dungeon Siege was a game at the oh, time. Yeah. Um, and I joined a modding community making little monsters. And, and, and it was sort of like the next level thing of... of how to do X, Y, and Z, how to get critters and things like that. This, I apparently didn't know how to use smoothing groups at the time because huh. <laughs> everything is so boxy. This was a, a challenge in one of our uh, our mod 
sessions of coming up with a cool critter that would be interesting in the game, yeah. little buildings and things like that. So, so I, I got my feet wet and was having a ball with with that kind of stuff, man. It was it was <laughs> super super exciting. Um, and that took me to my first game studio, and 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 that's where things kind of took the next level. It was like I went to a studio called. Uh, Lodestone, we were doing a car combat MMO at the time. It was ultimately huh. canceled. Um, but I got to uh, draw and implement all of the art on that game as well. Like, this was a, a vehicle I designed. <laughs> the Fjord um, is a vehicle that I made that, that got into the game that we were driving around. And um, and it was really fun because, again, you got you got to build this. is what the game looked like back in the, in the day. Yeah. Talk about Do you remember that. what this game was called? Uh, Driving Force. Driving Force. It's called okay. Driving Force. Sony actually ended up um, pulling the contract because Motor City Online. Mm. Motor City Online did so bad. It was such a colossal failure yeah. that they um, they no longer wanted any partnership with an online driving game. Huh. And so our contract was, was gutted. But we ended up going to Planet Side and we worked a little bit and partnered right. with an Austin studio doing some, uh, I did some textures for that. And then we got to a game called. Uh, this was years later when I was like, I know better. Mm -hmm. uh, but buildings, uh, it, it was fun. I did weapons on that game, and then we got to draw and design our own weapons. That's and this cool. is where I started learning like how to unwrap and pack materials and things like that. Yeah. And I had, a, I had a ball with these. I, I had a genuine ball. This was like very fulfilling and a lot of fun. They also animated when they shot. They did really neat stuff. Oh, that's cool. This was like a rail gun. So the vehicles, you would get different weapons and mount them on there and drive around and, and murder each other. Um, and then we moved to a game where we were porting a... a Champions of Norath game, I think, was on the console, and they asked yeah. us to port it. Sony asked us to port it to uh, PC, and we were like, you know, for what what for what you'll pay us to port, why don't we just make you a new IP, mm. something new you'll own? And they're like, oh, well, let's talk about that. So um, it was a tile base, and, and I went nuts because it was a game like Dungeon Siege, and I'd been modding that, and I wanted to keep that. Yeah. So these are these are the drawings I did of how the oh, tile man. system would work because it was going to be procedurally generated tiles, uh, and we got it up and working. We had a three month prototype, hmm. and so these are all the little doodles I did of like all the different shapes and what how walls connect and what kind of niches there are and what a corners look like. How do you do elevation changes? How do you do stairs? Uh, what are two-story options, like like the ones on the bottom, things like that, how to do bridges. Right. And I worked with a programmer on that, um, and uh, we got that to work. Like, like you hit a button, and it, it, it instantly took the first tile and last tile, and it filled it in. Wow. And you could just load in the game and run around and hack at some stuff. That was something that was, like... Those so types there's of, the tiles and maps, oh, like wow. the actual pieces that would snap together and, and, and move around. There weren't too many really games cool. around in that time period that did stuff like that either, right? Like those types of procedural systems? No, I feel like that there's, was... Yeah. That was, uh, we were pushing it at the time. We thought... I was doing concept art on the project. I, I just loved it. Oh, so cool. I brought my old drawing back. I, I did these little environment pieces and things like that. And so that... First, I think, ever aired out in the world. That was huh. a logo we came up with when and one of the entry characters into the game. And that was circa 2000 and... One? Two? Three? Okay. Uh, two? Somewhere around 2002. So... That was Soul Forge, huh? Um, which got me to um, uh, studio closed, mm -hmm. which is which which happens. Uh, it closed on the day that I was closing on a new house, and we were oh. uh, we had also <laughs> given up our lease. Oof! And my we were eight months pregnant. Oh, so that boy. night I was unemployed, yep. homeless, yep. <laughs> and about to have a baby. Oh, and we man. moved into a friend's basement, and uh, we all ended up getting to. Um, we got to go to uh, Mythic Entertainment. Was a few hours in, in Nova, Northern Virginia. Yeah. And all of us went, except for one guy, who's <laughs> here. <laughs> so yay! Uh, and we joined the Dark Age of Camelot team. Okay. And that was uh, that was fun. That was real fun. I don't know how you uh, what our time is. And, and it's. Uh, we have a comment from the chat from Feared Symmetry just saying, uh, "Please be sure to let Brian know how talented, and awesome an artist he is." Because damn. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> well, you can see in the Saints Row too, right? Like yes. Yeah. All of that culminating into uh, all the time I spent at Mythic, all the things I learned, I, I got onto here, and when I was able to join and help on uh, Stillwater, it was like, oh man. And, yeah. and Red Faction Armageddon um, was a whole unique set of challenges of building underground. We, had, we hadn't done things like that before, and that mm. was really, really fun and rewarding to figure out how we were going to pull all that off and get it done in, in some of the big changes that, that the game had to go through. But yeah, yeah. That was pretty cool. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, you know what? Let's let's just keep going. 
I'm we cool. Got time. You cool? Yeah. If I'm you're cool, cool, I'm cool. Everyone's cool. Damn. All right. Let's go. So I joined Mythic. You want to see some Mythic stuff? I'll be happy to. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I can talk, man. I'll, I'll show you all that day. Um, <laughs> so uh, this this was a very special time. Dark Age of Camelot um, had come out. Its first expansion had come out. I was playing this game. I mm -hmm. found out I was having a child in the middle of an RVR Oh, jeez. That's how much I was into Dark Age of Camelot. And so the opportunity to join a game studio as the most drooling fanboy on earth was, <laughs> was a dream come true. I, I walked through those halls, you know, like, like big doughy-eyed. Like, eh, there was nothing to look at, but I was just so yeah. excited to, to be a part of that project. And, and I was so into that game. I, I, that, that level of a... At the time, online MMORPGs were kind of limited. You had EverQuest, you had Asheron's Call, mm -hmm. maybe Ultima Online, but, but like Camelot was something different, and, and it just struck a chord with me. And um, being able to get in there, and, and kind of like the way I joined uh, Volition, I was mm -hmm. a prop artist. I made crates and barrels the first day. That's what all artists do on your first <laughs> day. Uh, but over five years at that studio, I became an art lead. Um, and I actually led uh, a couple of the expansion projects as, as the, um, the primary lead artist. I was also the art lead on Warhammer Online. Mm. Um, but they worked in a very similar way, and I worked with an artist um, who I'm not ashamed to say his name is Matt Weathers. He was lead concept artist at Zenimax for a while in Bethesda Projects. Mm. And he really taught me things that, that uh, to this day, I'm so humbled and appreciative to be able to collaborate with a guy like that. And, and we did it all on a whiteboard. He would just come over and we would just riff, like this is called the Jordheim Gate. Yeah. And we're like, how do we make the real, how do we get the real Midgard feeling of trolls and dwarves and snow? How do we make that heavy? And we would just doodle right there live, like no concept, we huh. just doodled until we came up with a primary motif, something that resonated in a shape and a silhouette. And then he'd walk away, he's like, you got this. And I would <laughs> run and I'd just build this stuff for days and days and days and days. Yeah. And, and we loved it, I, I absolutely loved it. Um, and, um, this was an expansion called uh, Darkness Rising, and um, this was all made up as we went. Like, like literally, yeah. we didn't we we didn't have a blueprint. It was like demon driven, and, and just let's just build stuff. And you got to make all the meshes, paint all the textures yourselves, like do all of this stuff. This is old, you know. Again, this is going oh, oh six maybe oh seven ish, I think ish around then. Okay, maybe no, uh, yeah, yeah, maybe oh five ish. Um, so the only tech, we, we didn't have normal maps in the game industry yet. They didn't come out. But yeah. we had um, specularity. Uh, you can only get eight lights in an entire zone loaded oh, wow. at once. So you had to be very careful. So you painted a lot of light in your texture to make it look like things were lit. Yeah. Uh, like like rays like that, those alphas, you couldn't do, you couldn't do a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, Man, look at this. But... Uh, Catalot was a very like old school type. A lot of your your commands, a lot of slash commands. Yeah. Uh, I actually uh, one of the, the the stages was to go through the entire game and and resurrect the, the graphics, like like bring everything up and, and refresh and, and update. This is one of the guild halls I did in, in the Camelot city. Yeah. Um, and so as a player to go back through and actually be able to, you know, creating new content is cool, but to go back to such important places that players need to play this game and, and, and have an opportunity to, to contribute. I was drooling at the chance <laughs> to continue to play. And, and, um, and they're stand-up guys. I actually still have lifetime accounts to, to the game. The game is still I live bet. and running. Broadsword is yeah, uh, a I bunch mean, of guys I know that maintain this game. There's still people playing it. That's great. Um, and, and I love it for that. I love that those guys are out there like fighting to keep this stuff up. And this is my pièce de résistance. <laughs> it's like I got to do the dwarf throne room. I didn't do King Eric. Um, this amazing uh, character artist did. Um, but but this was something that I that I concepted and designed and implemented and, and I was so happy and proud of how it turned out. Yeah. Um, and I did a lot of the Midgard stuff. I was an Albion player, so it just broke my heart because this was our, our like biggest beef enemy. Like we hate Midgard, Midgard hates Albion. But I did a lot of this stuff, and yeah. this is just goes to show you like like back in the day, you know what we had to work with in limitations. But it really spurred massive creativity. Those limitations really, yeah. you come up with interesting solutions to get all of that. And so all of this, um, when I I had left that and went to. Um, when I left that project, this this is this was sort of a trigger for me. I kind of mm -hmm. um, 
was leaving content creation at Mythic. I went back to content creation when I joined Volition, as, as, a, as that's what we needed, and that's what I did. Yeah. Uh, but I started doing more high-level art lead and art direction and general direction things. Mm. And uh, these were like paintings I did over the art to show like direction of lighting and detail. Right. This was Warhammer Online, the game that didn't actually have good lighting at the time that we shipped it. Uh, but I was still doing texture painting and things like that. Nice. For, uh, anything dwarves you got me. I was, I was <laughs> holding on dwarves. I love doors. I was still doing props, things like this, and, and you know, mortars and things like that. Again, more paint overs to show. I actually designed the entire uh, starting area. Mm. Uh, what we had wasn't working, and, and, and I actually worked with the designers to come up with a better way. You actually fired that cannon and caused an avalanche on the orc camp on oh, the that's other cool. side. And so we came up with this really epic capstone to this like moment of like playing this character, playing this race, and then moving on into the game. And I did a lot of texture painting, and actually. Um, I was one of the first guys to help set the style because we, we, we wanted to be a dirty wow was this kind of <laughs> the words we were using because wow was real popular. We knew we wanted to be stylized like Warhammer could be and should be. Yeah. Um, but but this was one of the early textures I painted to kind of show a lot of people like this. This is a way I think we can paint these things and get that get that out of it. And so all of that was an opportunity to to when I came here and interviewed at Volition, I had all these skills and all these abilities and so. Yeah. Uh, I was able to sit down and, and really see strategically the things that we, we were doing and jump in. Like I said, I got all those like technical interiors and things like that on, on Stillwater. Yeah. Uh, before we move on to the next thing, uh, if you could bring up some of the, those screenshots that you, you just showed from the, the Mythic stuff again, because uh, I just had some personal questions here. Yeah, cause, oh, sorry. Uh, I was actually having a conversation with my, my girlfriend about this because uh, I've never... I have been a person who's always avoided MMOs just because I see how much time people put into them, and I'm like, oh no, but I want to play other games too. Yeah, yeah. I did start playing my first MMO, which was Final Fantasy XIV, fairly recently, and something I noticed, and I, I, I've noticed it a little bit too, is like, on top of like zones in MMOs being, mm -hmm. you know, just they're they're large. Like I, I feel a lot yeah. of them want to have like a grandiose scale to them, so everything's very big. But like when you're making those environments, do you also have to like uh, account for the fact that there could be like a huge amount of players in one space because yeah. I've always noticed everything f always feels like uh, M MMOs like everything's a little spread out yeah. like compared yeah, as to design to, yeah. to try and get people to spread out and that, that, that also um, it's the same thing with like the, the global design mm -hmm. um, in, 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 in ways of naturally trying to funnel and get people out of areas like the amount of time you want people to spend in an area is mm. actually part of the design it's like oh okay. we should only spend an hour at levels one to X in this area so that we're getting people out and distributing them. And that is absolutely a major part of it. And stress testing is the biggest thing, is, is yeah. the biggest hurdle for any online game is like, and, and, and um, I had a lot of friends, because a lot of Mythic guys left because when we were bought by EA, they went down to help with the Star Wars MMO oh, yeah. in Austin at BioWare. And I had a lot of friends there that, you know, I remember tweets about like you know the the, the stress server hit fifteen. I'm like fifteen thousand. Great. They're like no fifteen. The game <laughs> crashed after fifteen people joined. Oh, no. like, uh oh. <laughs> and then but but then you 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 make your optimizations and tweaks. And so yeah. you're absolutely right. It is about um, more room, more space, and, and okay. making sure that that you can you can handle that. But they're they're kind of different. Um, uh, buckets of of memory and streaming and things like that for characters. But absolutely okay. like. I remember um, I, I played Vanilla WoW and Burning Crusade, all those early ones, and those are starter zones where you know yeah. loaded, and you'll get lag spikes and stuff like that. Just naturally trying your 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 PC and your connection trying to give you all that data. Yeah, um, but yeah, it was it was, and this was very much um, old school design. Mm -hmm. The design really was like here's a zone. It's got this theme. It's snowy. It's whatever. Uh, scatter enemies the appropriate level. You know when safe paths and and the design of the game was go out and kill things right. just kill things until you leveled up and then you go kill again and you go kill again and you go kill again okay uh, and eventually you meet more people meet more people and do other things like that um but yeah yeah very that's very, cool very old but um and that's what when i when i said earlier why why stillwater blew my mind yeah because it was denser it was packed it was more diverse it, 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 Supported co-op, like I, I just couldn't believe I've been working on these giant games for, for a decade, and I come here and I'm like, oh, mg, like this <laughs> city is, it's it's unbelievable. Everything that we could put a unique component into or layer upon in that city, we did. Right. Um, 
and I don't think we knew it at the time, but the, one of the strengths was because the, the teams had been sort of separa- separated and competing. The guys doing Marina and the guys doing Red Light were sort of like, you know, kind of in dark rooms with each other and then coming together to review. <laughs> it, it, it really helped because we'd see something that the other team did. Uh, I love university. I love yeah. university district. Uh, the cobblestones and all these great stuff. And, and uh, you'd go, we'd go in there and come out of review. I'm like, we got to go back and make ours better. <laughs> I need more dirt. Give me more dirt. <laughs> more, more decals and dirt. That's great. But uh, yeah, move, so after this, you went. This is when you went to Volition. Yep. Okay. Yep. I took all of that, um, and um, it was a no-brainer. Like I said, this was all PC, so getting into consoles yeah. was was a big thing. I really wanted to try and. Uh, Learn what that world was like, and I was and I was playing tons of PS. Like the PS One boom happened right yeah. right around that same phase, which was for me. I played, I mean, I, it was it was it was crazy. It was Resident Evil, yep. Tomb Raider One, mm-hmm. Siphon Filter, and I think FF Seven, yeah. Final Fantasy Seven. Like like though they came like within like it a was, year. Yeah, it was all like 1997, 1998. Yeah, they all like, came out yeah. in this Metal like, same era, so, and it was yeah. like. Unbelievable, right? Yeah. There, there were some of the greatest games. And I remember I finished Resident Evil and I went, I saw it at a friend's house. I went and bought everything that night. I, I don't even know how I afforded it. I bought <laughs> everything. And went back to the game store. I'm like, I just finished Resident Evil. Like, what do you got? He's like, yeah. this just came out and it was Tomb Raider. And I went oh, home man. and I was like, ah, finish that. And then um, I went back to um, the store and then, and, and like, what, what's now? And he's like, it was the next big title. I was like, you had to play them all. <clears throat> so I did grab some some shots of okay of some areas in here. So this was uh yeah so uh, th- there were two L's <laughs> in everything that I did the first time I came in here and those guys had to come out and each glass panel is a unique object I said before about the right. dynamic stuff so each one of those is unique and and so when you get into that gunfight and you start spraying you know bullets across that all that stuff starts breaking and then and, and your memory starts to get impacted yeah um, but. Really, like you had asked earlier, there was no concept art. What what was what this was was a green box mm. at that height with with that walk where you where you have that combat when you come out. That's what this was. Okay, and that that's what it, the gameplay had been iterated on. That's what the designers had approved. Um, as artists, we get to come in there and go like, how can I contribute to what's going on? So adding the desks at the bottom was like a cover point mm-hmm. for players and for enemies when when we came back out and had fights. Um, but you came up with the palette. You had to find all the textures or make them yourself and things like that. Yeah. Um, and it was really, really cool. Um, and then what's interesting, too, is the mission isn't done. Yeah. So you're building a lot of this art, and you don't quite know how players are going to experience it uh, yet because you're building it all, and, and you can play a little part, one part or, or another part. And the real thrill is when a cinematic gets done because mm-hmm. I did uh, the, the courtroom and I did the, the, the room in the back, the judge's chamber. And when those cinematics kick off, yeah. And you see your kind of art in the background of a cinematic moment because you got that story and you got that dialogue. That that's when stuff is really really cool. How much like were there times when you were making these where it's like you had to make make a change to accommodate a cutscene? Like was there ever something they wanted to do that wasn't possible with you know um, what? Often, so we had a we had a system where the, the cinematic guys because their pipeline is really long. It takes a long time to, to start and finish it. Yeah, they go in very early and they rough things in. And so what we had were these little objects in, the, in, our, in our levels that were they're called slates, and they look like little little movie, movie okay. cut slates. And that let an artist know that, that a cinematic takes place here. Mm. Um, the problem was we, we, we weren't, I wasn't good at triggering the cinematic <laughs> to see where the cameras were. Okay. Um, so mostly what would happen is we would do something and ruin a shot. So mm. if a camera is out here and two characters are having a chat, and I showed up and I put a big pillar <laughs> right <laughs> here, and the camera's trying to <laughs> listen to you know Johnny have a conversation with the player, um, and so you get a little email bug of like a screenshot of like, you know, okay. hey, you made a mess, and you try <laughs> to remind yourself next time. Oh, when I see a slate, let me play the cinematic before I go in there. Right. Um, but but it was more about an awareness. But those guys are really cool, and 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 they're uh, they're good at letting us know. During a time, and then they just come back and say like, "Hey, I'm sorry." Yeah. One of the, one of the real painful parts was we had um, we, a lot of the lighting was very expensive like, mm-hmm. for the kind of aesthetic quality we wanted in lighting, and um, we got this uh, mandate at the end of the project to just kill lights. 
go through and in, in, mm. in interiors like outside you got TOD interiors I've got lots of lights and you can only have so many at a time yeah so you have to place them in the right spot and you gotta you set them up and trigger so when the player rounds the corner these shut off and these come on oh man <clears throat> and I got this this mandate to like you, you need to kill 50% of lighting in all the all the interiors Oof. it was like whoa 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 because apparently we weren't shutting off lights in the world when you're in an interior even though we've outstreamed it oh and I'm like that's so unfair so um that was a significant challenge, and, and that ruined a lot of cinematics because they had a light in a spot where they set up a shot, and mm. I went in and I killed the light. <laughs> the cinematic plays, and it's literally black, and you just see shapes kind of trying to have a conversation. <laughs> and there's another one later on in a bar, uh, the shootout when the boss dives over the bar, yeah. and the old tour comes running in. Uh, there used to be thousands of bottles in that bar. Like, it would look badass, tons of bottles. It was awesome. And that blew memory, and I had to get rid of a lot of the props. So now, when you watch yeah. the cinematic, there's like six bottles, and as any, you know, like that's my <laughs> baby. Like, like I don't want you to see six bottles. I want you to see a real bar that you believe. In. Yeah. But but you have to make these really rough choices sometimes. Yeah. Um, and this was another one. Like I own downtown, um, so getting like all of these are unique memory, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but like you asked earlier, these are all us. Like like see right here. Um, let me zoom in. There's our names. There's Chris Claffin. Oh, shit. There's Tim Wasson. Tim did the, uh, I said the caves earlier. Yeah. Tim did it. Like, I think when this scrolls, all of our names are sort of snuck That's in That's great. Here. And these are the things we love to do. We love to sneak in um, all these little bits and pieces <laughs> and, and the signs. And there's an artist named um, Matt Upholz, who is one of the funniest people I've ever been around in my life. And he uh, came up with some of the funniest names of buildings in the game. The Tarnith Blur and uh, Darth <laughs> Phillinx. Yeah. <And> like, <laughs> he just comes up with the greatest names. So this was a challenge to get all these big buildings in, all the materials, yeah. all the signs, um, uh, you know, back in that day. <clears throat> and, of course, there's underground. There's, like, this whole wraparound section that goes over through here. There's interiors all over. There's an interior behind us. All of these are dynamic. I can run over and crush all these things. The lights, dis the lights dislodge. Yeah. Um, Man, like seeing the screenshots still, like I think this still, like you know, partially just because it's like framed up really nice stuff. This still looks really good to me. Like just the the amount of different facades and all that here yeah. is like, yeah, it's it's like I said, it, it's it's I won't say the word unicorn, but because of the limitations we had, that forced us to just make things and not just cookie cutter restamp things. Like like you do yeah. you do a lot now because it's just smart development, right? Like like things cost exponentially so much more because the quality's gone up so much uh, that these things are, are, are hard. Like in today's, yeah. they're really, really tough. They, they force you to focus. And these things are rotating and all those things have yeah. additional costs in it too. And as earlier, I, I um, um, the F-U-C, you know, that was me trying to be a little, <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> I was trying to be a little, a little fun. And there was some, uh, I think that I had a different name before that, that, that they deemed not appropriate. Huh. The F-U-C got through. So I don't even remember what I had. Oh, jeez. Um, but this, this, again, it wasn't the most sophisticated thing I ever worked on on the project, but, but I just really enjoyed the time I had. And I really enjoyed the, the gameplay. I love, I love going to the Fight Club and all those really cool cinematic takedowns and things yeah. like that. They're a lot of fun. Um, I was really happy to get that. And I think I actually picked that up from somebody that didn't have enough time. I think because okay. a lot of times uh, our stuff would fall off and uh, you couldn't get in. Uh, uh, that, that team couldn't do it. So they, they, they would be right. like, can anybody pick this up? And, and this was one of those ones that I just got in there. But things like the props, um, they were made. I said we had a prop artist. He made literally almost all of these props himself. Wow. He, that's all he did. He was so talented. Uh, a lot of that stuff we had, and we can just slap them in our spaces and use them. But the stairs and the ring and, and things like that, that, that's the stuff that we owned and made. And all the textures yeah. for that we, we owned and made. That was a lot of fun. And this one I, I found super rewarding, like going into the hospital and, and um, just little things like like I wanted the, you know, like the exit signs have emergency lights that turn on. Oh, yeah. That wasn't there when, when I got this interior. And so I grabbed the photo of what that looked like, and I made sure that I can get the lights on. So when we went into yeah. the power out mode, all the emergency lights could turn on. Um, but but just choosing your floor textures and getting like you know, even you know at the time, you try to separate color like a blue a blue stripe of paint versus a white stripe to kind of bring the eyes down and give you this really cool yeah uh, experience in there. And they, they they were just they were super fun. The work itself was fun. The tech side of loading the files was was challenging. But yeah. Uh, for when you you know you were doing 
a lot of the the world stuff for this. Was there ever times where you just like actually went somewhere to get photo reference or like just? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. On um, so I believe on Saints Row Two there was a road trip. Okay. I think I think they went to uh, Detroit. Okay. And a bunch of guys and cameras rode through a big industrial urban city and took thousands of photos. And for Saints Row Three, uh, went to Pittsburgh. Okay. And they had uh, this awesome setup where they hung a camera out of the car, mm -hmm. and they videotaped just like this low shot of driving because we <laughs> wanted to really see roads and cracks in roads and yeah. details and like how they, how they fix roads. So uh, yeah, we we would do that a lot. And and now, uh, geez, we didn't have Google Maps, but yeah, I mean, my gosh, right? It could have been like. Right. <laughs> And on AOM, we used Google Maps a lot because we built Seoul, so we were really right. looking at like like what what was in there and what what makes sense. Uh, something you might be interested in. So I found uh, when I started working here again, I dug up a really really old tiny digital camera that has like four or five videos on it. They're like ten seconds long each, and it's one of those road trips. Oh, nice! Yeah, I, yeah. I think Do it was for one? I think it was for Saints Row. It was it was dated like two thousand eight. Yeah. So it's probably that Saints might Row be early pre pro and three, yeah, yeah. the road trip. Nice, uh, but yeah, it's yeah. I've shown a couple people those, and it's just like, why is this still here in the office? <laughs> I just sitting. It's on all there. really short clips too. Like I think you could see like Kate in the back of the car, and like a couple other people who are still nice. here too. But it's yeah, it's I think uh, funny. Chris Claffin went, and maybe Victor Duarte. Like, yeah, I think a lot of our EAs went, and just 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 got I keep, photos. Of that I keep stuff. asking cool. people if like anyone can tell like who's holding the camera, but no one's figured it out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. well, they did have it mounted. I know that because yeah, uh, for for three in, in terms of Steelport, it was it was a little bit of a, like heavier on industrial, um, and that's a big thing. Um, I didn't I didn't put as much time in three on two, mm. um, but um, the reason why. A lot of that that, that diversity kind of went away. It was to really focus down on on less and try to make those those pieces um, more detail and, and higher yeah. polish and things like that. Because it, it it's the endless battle and development of of quantity and quality. Right. They, they are they are always opposing each other. Yeah. And in production, we have the triangle, which is better, faster, cheaper. Yeah. And you can pick two sides. You yep. can't have all three. You can't have it better. You can't have it faster and cheaper. You can yeah. have it cheaper and faster. That means it's not better. Yeah. And so often that's just uh, the, the, the game we play of choosing. Yeah. And I, I feel like, you know, anybody who works on games, like, I'm sure, you know, if they could, they would put everything in that oh, absolutely. they want. Absolutely. Like, you got to yank us away from it, typically. I mean, yeah. Quite often. And we're, we're our worst critics. You know, we, we're, yeah. we're staring we're staring at a way that the players typically won't. Mm -hmm. the, typic the players are in a moment and having an experience and they're being motivated to do something else. But as an artist or a developer, we're, we're certainly in art, we're staring at a pixel and we're like, <laughs> yeah. oh, that's just not the right pixel. And we'll watch people play in the game and we'll do our play tests and they're like, <laughs> they ran right by the thing that you were worrying about for the last two weeks. Like, yeah. That makes sense. But uh, that, that's our craft, right? Yeah. Uh, so I guess before we, we wrap it up, uh, we have a couple questions we ask everybody who, okay. who have been on here, especially if it's their, their first time or first time in a while. Uh, one, uh, what games have you been playing? What do you do outside of work? Uh, Games-wise, um, well, what I do outside of work is I instantly shift into dad and husband mode. I, yeah. I have three kids, and so <laughs> my game time goes boop. But um, <laughs> it's interesting. My kids are getting bigger, so a lot of my games that I play... They balance between things that I like. Uh -huh. I'm a Borderlands fanatic. Okay. So the DLC came out. I'm right, right now, yeah, right yeah. Now I'm getting through the DLC. I even went and played Tales of the Borderlands, mm -hmm. getting ready for the three announced because I am I am a I'm a Borderlands nut. I love it. Yeah. Um, but I also love. Um, I have to confess, I actually picked up a new PC because uh, I'm gonna play with my boys. Like we're we're setting we're getting ready our four player. Oh yeah. Experience for September to play nice. Borderlands. Um, and a lot of the games that I play are, are heavily impacted by my kids because I, I try to play games with them. Yeah. And we're a gaming house. I met my wife playing Dungeons and Dragons. Nice. And um, she played Camelot with me for years. We played WoW together for years. Like like we, all we do like Friday nights in my house are like you know chug down a burrito and like get on and, and play. <laughs> so we love couch co-op. Okay. So even today we play tons of Diablo three because because that that gets us all yeah. in the room together. I have a nine year old daughter and, and she. We play Castle Crashers with her. Castle right, Crashers, so, pretty so good. So right, right now it's Borderlands. My son is um, really getting into D and D. Uh, he he wants to write, 
So, oh, okay. so I, we were playing Divinity, uh, so a bunch yeah. of older stuff. Uh, there's nothing super new right now. There's a bunch of things on my summer. I'm waiting for some sales and yeah. Up. But right now it's Borderlands DLC is, is what I'm trying to get through, and it was having a lot of fun. Uh, <laughs> Matrix Benji in the chat asking, "Tell us about your character. What's your favorite tabletop game?" Also, um, okay, uh, my <laughs> character is a narcoleptic cleric. So I'm a healer that doesn't heal because I'm usually asleep. <laughs> but but <laughs> that's, that's that's typically good. my dude. But but um, that's the one I'm playing right now. My favorite tabletop. So this is interesting because um, I'm pretty much a hardcore D and D guy. I've, I've played every edition. Yeah. Uh, we have once a month. I play at home with the family. I write a story. I DM for my kids. Um, and um, there's an old '80s board game that yeah. I play. It's called Dark Tower. Oh, I know and, that. And yeah. Dark Tower, uh, I got it for Father's Day like two years ago, mm. and and I play that all. I literally play that maybe once every three weeks. That thing comes out. We still play Dark Tower. We actually play yeah. Dungeon, too. The the remake of oh, the Dungeon yeah. board game. Um, so those are those are probably. I know they're not the, the hardcore tabletop. Uh, we were yeah. playing Descent for a while. I got my kids into Descent. Okay. Uh, we were playing that for a bit cool. too. I, I like that a lot. Love D and D, and I love that my son loves D and D. It's like it's like the greatest thing right now. <laughs> I am playing a lot of Fortnite. My my twelve year old is is really into Fortnite. So um, he's like, "Come on, Dad, squat up, man! You're so slow, old man. Come on!" Do uh, I'm trying to do what I can do. Do your kids do the Fortnite dances? Oh yeah, endlessly. They do. Anywhere okay. we're standing, they're flossing uh, and they're arranged justice. And I feel like I'm I'm still hipping I don't know with what they it. are, but yeah, I feel like I'm still hipping with it enough because like I. So you know the Steakhouse Alexander's that's near yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I literally one time while waiting for food there, like, it was like there's another table. It wasn't very busy, but like there's some family there with like a twelve year old, their twelve year old son or whatever, <laughs> and like. I like looked over once and he was flossing. I looked away. Thirty seconds later, I look over and he's doing the worm yeah. on the damn floor of the steak. Yeah, yeah. But it's like I saw that once. And I was able. To, I was able to pick it up. So it's like what? I can floss. I won't floss on stream though. I have dignity. What's amazing? I'm Thirty. What's amazing though is um, they're they're wonderful insights. Like I have a yeah. fifteen year old, a twelve year old, and a nine year old, mm -hmm. and I watch all of them. Like I I didn't know gotcha. Yeah. I wasn't into gotcha. My daughter introduced me to Gotcha Life and, and all her gotcha videos. I watch what they're what they watch on TV. Uh, Office is so popular in today's high school. Mm -hmm. Like every kid gets out of a car to high school with like uh, Dunder Mifflin T-shirts. Yeah. It's like whoa. But I watch what they play too, and I really uh, I, I see the, the trends in gaming and, mm -hmm. and games today are like like the content and the Best. interactions Constant. and the stimuli is nuts. Yeah. My son will play Fortnite. Um, maybe I'm a bad game dad. They have game time. <laughs> I promise you they, they have X amount of time. They're not yep. allowed to play too much. Uh -huh. But he will have, he'll be playing Fortnite. He'll have his phone streaming a streamer of also, Fortnite uh, yep. while on the phone on speaker with his buddy in his squad. Oh, and so man. he's got all these inputs, and then usually three kids in the room, one kid on the Switch, one kid on the PC, one kid on the Xbox. Yeah. So he's getting all these inputs of gaming. That's and nuts. And it's like, I can't, I'm, I'm watching this, but that's, that, that's our next gen. Like, yeah. like, like he's 12, like he's, he's getting into it, and he's actually really good. He kicks my butt. <laughs> and I used to hold my own in shooters, and we'd go in some 1v, uh, 2v2 modes, and he yeah. kicks my butt. So we moved in to save the world. Um, Oh yeah, that's a that's a good one. Uh, my fifteen year old, uh, yeah, is he gonna play? Is is playing Saints Row three on the Switch? Oh nice. Yeah, yeah. He's 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 a very mature fifteen year old, and, and yeah, yes, it's rated mature. <laughs> um, but um, we're also a, a major horror. We love horror films. Like, like oh, Family yeah, Movie totally. Night in my house is like Conjuring two or or yeah. something along those lines. Like it, like like we we're, we're a horror <laughs> house. Um, but um, uh, believe actually, one of the things that um, I have kept my kids away from gaming are a lot of like really gun and, and like knife violent and physical violent games, okay. like cartoon violence and Fortnite. That, that they play that stuff. Yeah, that's so when we goofy. get together, we, we do a lot of fantasy type games like that. Yeah, and luckily they haven't wanted to. They never come to me for Call of Duties or, or stuff like that. Okay, so, yeah, so Soldier of Fortune good. too. No, yeah, no blasting was, bodies apart. Yeah, that was that was, that was <laughs> <laughs> I was grown then. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, cool. Mega Freeman also asking, "Who's your Borderlands main?" Uh, in two, I have the soldier Axton. Yeah, right. Yeah, I, I, I went with that uh, in the rematch because the remaster came out. Mm -hmm. If you owned it, I went with Brick. 
Because I remember when Brick came out, I was like, why would I want melee powers in a shooter? Like, this this ain't my, this not my jam. Yeah. Uh, so when I came back to it, Brick is just so cool. And now mm. I, I actually love him because he goes in that psycho mode and he's laughing, punching guys in the yeah, face. Yeah, I remember, pop, 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 I, haven't played, shattering. I haven't played a ton of Borderlands, but I did play as him in, in 2, and like, that was, he yeah. was immensely satisfying to yeah. play as. Um... Yeah, my uh, my one son was Zero. My other son is um, um, Lilith. Yeah, or Mordecai. Well, I'm, I'm mixing my games up. I'm sorry. Uh, we have different roles in in, in, in the games. It depends yeah. on what we're we're playing in there. I'm I'm excited for three, and I, I like that what I'm seeing in three is is it's, it's kind of what I want. Right. Like you don't have to innovate. You don't have to reinvent the wheel when it comes to that game for me. I mean, it's like, also like, give it's... me what I'm looking for. They've innovated in areas. It looks like it's got some really cool. Dials turned up yeah. and knobs, and, and I'm I'm on board, man. I'm I mean, it's also happy. just been it's been a while since two, yeah. so it's like sometimes when it's been like like that, it's just like yeah, just give me more of that, but like yeah. turned up some way, you know. I think they were getting some negative buzz from from some folks that thought maybe some innovate more innovations, but sometimes ah. I, I wonder if like people think innovations are the things that you, you, you need to dive into, but yeah, I just want more of that. Like, yeah, just give me more. I want more content in there, and, but I like what I'm looking at. Yeah, I'm excited. Um, I guess our, our last question that I ask people is, uh, how do you feel about, like, you brought it up, if you are you haven't been to any of our streams before, if you, you, know, you miss out a bunch of them, we are working on a new game, we can't say anything else other than we're making it, but how do you feel about it? Um, I haven't been this happy and excited uh, about a project in, in quite a while. Yeah. Like, um, just just... When you when you start a project early on, you get a picture in your head, mm -hmm. and 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 um, often projects will just they they live and breathe and they change and, and they evolve over over you yeah. over, over over things and um, this one is is exactly what I was hoping it would be. Yeah, I'm, I'm just I'm, I'm super. I, I can't talk because yeah. I, I can't. So all I can it's, say is I, I'm happy. I, I, am, I am so effing happy. Yeah, I mean it's, <laughs> and, it's I, it, and I'm surrounded by happy people too. And yeah, that's it was that's, just one of those things where it felt like the pieces fell into place pretty quickly. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So but I dig it. Yeah, thanks everybody thanks. for yeah. for watching. This is a ball. Uh, yeah, this was rad. Uh, it was really cool seeing some of the stuff he did, especially like cool. I, I really like seeing like the stuff he worked on for for the MMO stuff. Like that's cool. I'm glad. That's yeah. really cool. But uh, yeah, thanks everybody for uh, coming by and, and watching and, and asking us all those really good questions yeah, and stuff. Yeah, appreciate it. Nice to meet everybody. Um, we'll, we'll and get to see people again. Yeah. Once again, uh, Hope you I'm, me back. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> yeah. No, you'll be on again for sure. Uh, but yeah, thanks for watching everybody. Uh, again, I'm Josh Denson, the editor here, and uh, today we have. Brian Tropicanti, creative director. Also, uh, thanks, Mike, for moderating all our stuff. Hey, thanks for watching, guys. And, uh, yeah, we'll uh, see you next week, same time. Later, everybody.